Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Great Fiction Podcast. This is episode two. Today, I'm joined by co-host Noah Carter. Normally, I have Thomas co-hosting with me, but he is very busy with school, so he will join us on a later date. And unfortunately, this won't be a weekly podcast as I originally planned, but I will try to post these episodes as much as I can. Hey everyone, I am Noah Carter and I am currently pursuing a degree in economics with minors in computer science and mathematics. Um, I am published with LOPH Business and have some other publications coming uh, pretty soon. All right, everyone, we have a great show for you today. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to a very special economist and talk about a really awesome paper he wrote. So let's jump into it. The entire statist edifice can be brought down if only the work of the intellectuals is countered by the work of anti-intellectual intellectuals, as I like to call them. Today we are joined by Vincent Galoso. He is an assistant professor of economics at George Mason University. He is a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. He earned his PhD from the London School of Economics, and uh, he has worked on the great Economic Freedom of the World Index with the Fraser Institute. And most importantly, why we have him here today is his paper that he wrote with Mr. Candela. Raid or Trade, Acadian Settlers and Native Americans, where he talks about the stateless phase in Acadia. So, uh, Mr. Goloso, uh, could you please give us a summary of the paper and then sort of tell us what inspired you to uh, look into Acadia? If you don't mind, I'll flip, I'll flip the question around why I think comes in first. The, and then I'll, I'll, I can explain the paper. I think this is important. So I don't hide the fact that in academia, I'm a very hardcore libertarian. Uh, but uh, my libertarianism does not inform the answers I provide. They only motivate the questions I ask. And I'm super interested in anarchy as a research question, more precisely statelessness as a research question, because what we really need to care about is that the idea that the production of rules is itself a productive activity. When people produce governance, it is a form of production. Uh, just as producing cars, widgets, uh, iPods, drugs fits the category of being a productive activity. Uh, it's just one productive activity is going to affect all the other ones in subsequent years. So it's important to understand how people from a blank slate in the situation of statelessness can actually develop institutions that create order, a stable framework for exchange. And when I say stable framework for exchange, I mean mutually beneficial exchanges, even if there is heterogeneity between people. Because we do have a literature that says in economics that uh, if you have a homogenous group of people who are very similar, trade is actually very able to sustain without a state. What happens, however, if the two groups of people are very different? So there's a greater number of people, and not only is there a greater number of people, they're very different people. And this is where people argue that cooperation breaks down. And one of the, the claims I've made is, okay, you've made an argument. Let's test it out. Let's try and find settings in history where people had uh, uh, trading relationships uh, in statelessness in relatively large numbers in the presence of heterogeneity. Uh, and that's the paper uh, I did with Rossellino Candela. And basically what we do is we look at uh, French settlers in uh, what is known as Acadia, uh, today in Canadian history, but is essentially the, the areas of Nova Scotia and uh, New Brunswick. For Americans who know nothing about Canada, because I'm Canadian, uh, who know nothing about Canada, it's these two places north of Maine, right? Uh, so that's the idea you have in your mind. Look where Maine is, look a bit to the east and the north. That's where we're, that's the areas we're talking about. And in these areas in the 18th century, French settlers came there and the state was so weak that they were pretty much left to, uh, to be on their own. And in their near vicinity, there was a relatively large group of Native Americans. Uh, in Canada, we call them First Nations. Uh, so, and they were known as Micmacs. And the Micmacs were uh, a relatively uh, uh, populous nation for, for the region. Uh, they were fearsome warriors, uh, 
And the part that's exceptional that historians recognize is that in this one area, relationship between settlers and First Nations, and this is a quote, were exceptionally peaceful and prosperous. Uh, so people recognize that there was something unique about this area. And what me and Rosalino did is we checked out why it was uh, particularly uh, peaceful and prosperous. And the reason we the reason why we point this out is that because there was absent a state, there was no one to delegate the cost of organized violence to. So that means that if the settlers wanted to gain more areas to settle, there was two ways for them to do so. They would either buy land. Well, actually, there was three ways. They could buy it from the Indians. They could reclaim it by draining marshlands that weren't uh, hunting grounds uh, or traditional religious uh, grounds for the native Mi'kmaqs, or they could fight the Mi'kmaqs for it. The problem is if they fought the Mi'kmaq, the cost was A, they'd have to fight it themselves. No French army would come and fight for them. No French taxpayer would fight, would pay for that army. So they'd pay the entire cost of violence. And that cost of violence also came with eliminating a group with a very specific comparative advantage which namely was trapping furs. And trapping furs is a big deal if you're Canadian. Uh, I mean, I'm playing to stereotypes about Canada, but fur trading is a big deal, both for Canadian stereotypes and in Canadian history. So uh, the native Mi'kmaqs uh, were very good hunters and were able to provide large quantities of fur pelts to the French Canadian settlers who would then trade them for foodstuffs that were not familiar for the Mi'kmaqs and then sell them illegally in Boston and in Halifax or other colonies. And so uh, if you engage in a war with the, the Mi'kmaqs, if you were a French settler, not only were you going to pay the entire cost of violence, but you would also lose the stream of benefits from trade due to this very specific and hard to capture advantage that the other group has. So the French Canadians invested large resources in draining basically marshland, reclaiming areas from the Bay of Fundy uh, in order to create new land from, from the sea, thereby never trespassing on Indian grounds. And the Indians saw this as an act, a commitment to peaceful relationships. And so it, it cemented uh, an exchange pattern where until the British took over the colony and decided to deport the French settlers forcibly in the 1750s, you had a long century of peaceful cooperation. And when we try and measure, because as an economic historian and as an economist, I can recreate GDP numbers for the distant past. And when you look at measures of living standards in the region, the region is exceptionally rich. It's uh, richer than the other French colonies in North America, namely Quebec. Uh, not only is it richer than Quebec, but it's also as rich as New England. It is richer than France. It is richer than Mexico. It is nearly as rich as Britain. Uh, so it is an, it's an incredibly rich place uh, by all standards and metrics. Uh, it's one of the richest places in the world at that time. And the numbers I compute for, for Acadia are very conservative, in fact. There's every reason to believe that it's probably even a bit richer uh, than it was. And this was well exemplified in the fact that the French-Canadian population there grew at an annualized rate of roughly 7%, which is huge uh, from a demographic standpoint. 7% extra people year in, year out, without a stop, without a slowdown, is, is exceptional. And it's a sign of really rapid economic growth. Uh, so it's, it's a good case, I think, for saying that statelessness uh, is able to generate outcomes that are going to be high income, high development, and, uh, and also going to be peaceful uh, in a situation like this. Uh, so that's the, ver that, that's, the, that's the summary, if you want, of why I did that paper and what it says. All right. So, uh, Actually, the way I found this paper was sort of a culmination of three factors. And first was Peter Leeson. I kind of, uh, I, I discovered Peter Leeson a while ago, mostly because his famous uh, Somalia paper. Um, but I was going through his website and I found this uh, paper. I think it was called Are 
anarcho-capitalist insane or something like that. Yeah, that's and, with uh, me. Yeah, okay. So you together. so you helped with that? Yeah, we co-authored that one together. But actually, this this other paper uh, with Pete Leeson is actually a good idea, a good point that we make in the that we try to make that economists need to appreciate is uh, the production of rule is itself a productive activity. And when you compare stateless societies with comparable state societies at the same point in time, they stateless societies are not necessarily bad. They actually have generally very high favorable outcome. So the paper I did with Pete Leeson was take this very classic case in the libertarian and anarcho-capitalist literature of medieval Iceland as being a very free marketplace with an immensely weak state that couldn't do jack shit. Uh, and you had no ge geographic monopoly of violence in any given area. People could move between chieftains. It was closest thing to a stateless order you would, you would observe, but no one had actually tried to measure outcomes. So using the Gragas, which I'm pronouncing terribly, uh, which were early, uh, basically common law books, if you want, that repertory discussions between chieftains. Uh, they have prices, they have data about wages. So we were able to recreate some information about living standards. And what we find is that uh, medieval Iceland, despite being Iceland, right? So it's a barren, inhospitable land at the end of the world. It's cold. It's dark. I wouldn't want to live there today, even though it's a rich country. Uh, but back then, it was also a relatively rich country. It was richer than any area in the Mediterranean basin. It was probably richer than France, which in the medieval period was probably the richest region of Europe. It was also pretty much on par with Britain, which is a big deal. Uh, so that's observed in terms of wages, uh, wages and how much they commanded in terms of goods. You can also observe it in genetics and stature. So generally the height of people. So you use, so if you take dead people and you measure how tall they were in terms of their remains, you can get an idea of their level of nutrition. The idea is that well-fed people are generally going to be higher income people. And because they're higher income and better fed, they're going to be taller. So you can take the height of a person and infer all the rest from that. And so exceptionally tall Icelanders, especially compared with their genetic closest, like uh, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, uh, you find that they're uh, exceptionally tall, uh, for the standards of the time, they do quite well. They're very, uh, very tall people, suggesting that they're very well fed, thus confirming the, the numbers that we got from the wages. The point me and Pete are making is that not only is statelessness uh, something worth studying, uh, not only as a, as a case of comparative uh, uh, economics, but also as a case of uh, empirical work of, of living standards. The part where uh, I'm not sure, I've never talked to Pete, even though we're colleagues, we've, I've never pushed him on that particular point, but it's a part of another paper I have in Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, which is called State Capacity uh, and Correlative Filter. And the argument I make in that paper is the reason why statelessness yields at a given point in time outcomes that are high development uh, but we never observed them lasting centuries on end. The, the Icelandic case ends in the Norwegian conquest of, of Iceland. Uh, the Akkadian example ends in the conquest and deportation uh, uh, of, Acad of Acadians by the British after the area is ceded to the Brits. Uh, well, actually, is conquered by the Brits formally in 1755. So there's uh, one of the largest proportional, all proportions held of deportations in human history, even though it's a relatively small population in absolute number, but roughly 75% of the Acadians are deported to Massachusetts, Louisiana, uh, other areas. Those who are not deported try to flee to the other French colonies. So it's a complete uh, massacre in the end. And the point I make in that paper is that, well, the reason why we don't observe rich stateless society persist over time is because it's not a stable equilibrium. Uh, the reason why is rich stateless societies 
will become prey to societies that have states and can conquer them and gain wealth uh, very cheaply through violence. Or stateless society, so in that case, they disappear and are absorbed by others, or they themselves have capacity to protect the wealth they were able to generate. So in both cases, if you imagine like a two by two box where you have weak state and weak strong state on one side and high development and low development on one side, you will get a lot of countries that have strong state and are rich, like OECD countries. You'll have some countries that are very poor and have strong states like the USSR, Cuba, North Korea. You'll have a lot of countries with weak state and low development, but people will have a hard time finding the populating the box of countries or areas or polities that are relatively stateless, have i.e. weak state and have a high level of development. The reason why that box is empty is because it cannot last for long periods of time. The stable equilibrium, unfortunately, is that even though statelessness seems to yield very good outcomes in comparative terms, uh, it is not a stable one. It is one that is doomed to end either in conquest or in uh, uh, the construction of a state to protect existing level of wealth from predators, essentially. That's interesting. I didn't know about that paper. I'll have to check it out. Um, but yeah, the the one with Leeson is a very excellent one. I'll make sure I link these in the uh, in the description. And now, um, well, most of what Pete writes is really good, except oh, when yeah. he disagrees with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got I got his uh, Anarchy Unbound book, and I've been kind of going through. Very that. good it's book. Excellent. Um, and now, what else caught my eye about your paper is specifically the title, because I was familiar with Anderson's paper from '94 which is excellent. I loved it when I found it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't remember how I found it. I think maybe I heard about it from, uh, from one of the lectures about the not so wild, wild west. And uh, I found that paper and it was, it was really good and really well written and researched. It is a very good paper. Um, and then also I'm actually part Acadian. So my, on my mother's side, my family came directly from Acadia. Uh, they're the ones that came down to uh, Louisiana. Um, so like we have family history, uh, you know, they were the, they were the ones who were deported, uh, by the British. So all those things kind of culminated in like this real interest for this paper, which is why I wanted to do a podcast episode on it. Um, I also did a YouTube video on it. Um, okay. So now I will kind of jump into maybe some questions that we have, uh, for you. So I think, uh, Noah, you had, you had one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of tying into what you were talking about just a minute ago, um, I was wondering if you could go into how you calculated uh, all these things, such as the um, amount of wealth they had and kind of the overall GDP. I know you mentioned it in the paper, but uh, I was wondering if you could kind of go into what you did there. Okay, so my original field of training as an economist is in measuring living standards. Uh, so I've dedicated the first, I think, three years of my career in just really boring issues of measurement, which makes me one of the most boring person to have at, 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 a ta at the dinner table. I can talk for hours about uh, the relationship between heights and nutrition and how this correlates with income. I can spend hours on how much we measure, how we measure wages, what wages really mean, uh, what happens if there's blah, 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 like a million conditionals. Uh, but essentially, one of the big reason why we should care about this is uh, people, well, actually, here's a line I really like. If it matters, measure it. And the, re the, the fact of the matter is, is economic theory gives us a clear way of, of measuring thing. And there's an endless pool of, well, not endless, but there's a large pool of information that history gives us that we can use to test very strong theoretical axiomatic statement that we make in the real world. And it's worth doing it in and of itself uh, just to understand just even like how far we've moved in terms of just living standards broadly defined, but also compare, understand unicities, uh, uh, exceptionalities in, in human history. 
Uh, but for the case of how I did it, like nitty gritty details is uh, you can use, so anyone who's done like an intro to macro classes or even your AP macro class, you've seen basically the GDP identity of C plus I plus G plus XN. Uh, well, in the case of a stateless society, G, which is government, doesn't exist. So that part is really easy to measure. It's a zero. Uh, but the other stuff, uh, you can actually use censuses that were made, uh, tight surveys will give you an idea of uh, production levels. So you can basically recreate an idea of GDP. And if you have other places, you can compare it that use similar uh, methods, you can arrive at comparison. So what I did is, uh, because my first work was on the other French colony in North America, Quebec, and I had created, I had used three ways of measuring GDP, uh, all three ways that you could. And the reason why is I wanted to use that colony as a pivot. So if I could express, say, uh, I could only measure in one type, say England, but Quebec in three types, but I could measure, say, Argentina in another type, as long as I knew how big Quebec was relative to Argentina, and how big Quebec was relative to England, then by using Quebec as a pivot point, I could know how big England was relative to Argentina. That was the idea. And so I had this data for Quebec and I was able to do one of the methods for Acadia. And in doing that, I was able to do a ranking and compare with what is essentially uh, proxies of GDP per capita for circa 1705, if you want. And the, the fact of the matter is, is what we arrive is Acadia was roughly 100% uh, richer than the French colony of Quebec, uh, by far richer than any area that's Spanish populated in the Americas. Uh, so more than one and a half time as rich as Latin America, as rich as, as New England, pretty much. Not a big gap, but New England is one of the richest place in the world in the 18th century. It is exceptionally, it is known as the best poor man's country. That's the name it was given back then. And you find that the same statement is made for the Acadian colony. Uh, it is also the best poor man's country uh, in, in North America. So it's an exceptionally rich place. Uh, and it's, it's worth underlining uh, the fact that it's essentially a rich place in the absence of a strong state. There is, it's not that there's no state, by the way, in the region. There was, there was one, it's just nobody cared about it. Uh, people just never even listened to its edict. Uh, it came around, did some censuses. People didn't give a shit about it. Sorry for cussing, uh, but really people just, eh, eh, okay, hello. Oh, we'll just say hi to the queen. We'll, we'll, do, this, we'll do an oath and just leave, leave us alone. And that's what basically happened for, nearly a century and a half in, in the region. People didn't give a shit about uh, right. the rulers. And uh, from what I understand, there was a few smaller conflicts with uh, New England um, during various periods. Uh, are you very uh, familiar with that? Can you explain what was going on there? So the conflicts with New England mostly have to do with New England not liking having uh, uh, French neighbors, uh, but also competitors. And uh, one thing that happens that really changes the dynamic from trade to raid is that in the early uh, 18th century, the British starts subsidizing a, another colony in, in Nova Scotia, and it's known as Halifax. And it's basically a pork barrel spending project. It's insane the amount of money that is spent to colonize the area and create a strong military presence uh, uh, in that region in order to assert military control over the area. And the settlers of both New England and, um, and, uh, and Halifax uh, uh, are really becoming, uh, are seeing the arrival of a strong state with an army and a navy that they're not paying for. It's British taxpayer back in England. Who, who are paying for it and it changes the incentives. And so they start becoming more aggressive and pushing for more aggressive behavior towards the French colonists. And uh, there is, and I, I think about it, I talk about it in the paper, 
there is uh, some uh, some newspaper uh, 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 at the in Colonial America that uh, that talk about uh, after the arrival of the state presence in the English speaking area. Uh, they say we have to deport the Frenchies. Uh, and there's a letter that's sent to a new, a famous newspaper in, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's republished in New York and Maryland, uh, also Massachusetts, as they discovered after the paper was published. And there's a quote in the paper that calls the expulsion of the Acadian a great and noble scheme. And a chance to obtain, this is a quote, uh, like I had to look it up in the paper, I had to find the exact quote, a chance to obtain land, quote, as good as any in the world. Uh, it is clearly a rent-seeking operation, but what happened here is in the trader raid model is you trade as long as the cost of negotiation are inferior to the cost of fighting, all else being equal. Uh, when the army arrive and it's British taxpayer who pay for violence, the result is, well, fighting's cheaper now, at least for us, the settlers, and we're still getting the same benefits because we're the one getting the land. The people back in Britain, eh, they may be gaining something here and there, but for them, it's trivial. It's not going to change their income. It's not going to make them better off. So the cost is paid by somebody else. It's going to be made poorer, and I still get the benefits. Seems easy for me to start pushing for this. And they're very obvious about it. They don't hide it. They actually write in the newspapers that this is what they want to do. So this hat, this creates a tilt from trade towards raid. And the result, unfortunately, is the deportation of the French settlers. And after the French settlers are deported, uh, the British colonists really don't give a crap about the Micmacs, the Native Americans in the region. And they start, uh, the, 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 the relations start deteriorating. Uh, there's st basically state-sponsored uh, violence against them, organized uh, expropriations, and uh, going from, and this is a paper that's underway, so uh, it's not in public yet, but uh, I've looked at all the settings where the initial contact was for a lot between natives and non-natives, so this is preliminary work. I could be wrong for the time being, but for now it's suggestive of that is I check how long the stateless contact is and how much of a population contraction the First Nations get. And that's because you would expect this from disease shock from uh, completely different microbial environments they devolve in, but you'd get more death if on top of that there's violence. But if my argument is correct under statelessness, you'd have less violence. So populations that have a stateless presence for an extended period of time would actually have smaller declines in First Nation population. The Mi'kmaq actually look like that. They do have uh, a contraction of roughly 25 to 30 percent in the century after contact, but it stabilizes uh, really fast, unlike other nations that collapses sometimes as much as 50 to 60 percent. But they also, the other nations don't pick up as fast. But for the 60 years before deportation, there's good reason to believe that the Mi'kmaq population was, the, uh, was on the up and up. It was on the recovery path. Uh, and it's only when the, the Acadians were forcibly thrown out that then the population of Mi'kmaqs not only declined in relative terms, it also declined in absolute terms uh, because of... Uh, what is essentially state-sponsored violence towards them and, and attempts to expropriate uh, them from their land claims. Uh, so the result was uh, lower outcomes, not only for the French settlers, which is easy to understand, they've been deported, their farms have been destroyed, their cattle has been seized. It's very straightforward. But in the longer run, it also has impact on the Mi'kmaqs. They lose their trading partners, but eventually they also lose an ally. Uh, they also gain a, a neighbor that is more hostile towards them. And the result is the, the, the demographic, demographic decline and falling living standards as well. Right. And didn't even the uh, Acadians try to uphold, you know, things like gun rights and property rights for the uh, for the Mi'kmaqs? Uh, yeah. So the, the, the Acadians really didn't care what the Mi'kmaqs did. Uh, there's actually so in there the system of how they operated. 
Uh, in draining the marshlands, you had, well, this is getting into technical details, but you had to organize dikes, uh, basically constructing very complex uh, uh, dikes to drain uh, lands, but also to create uh, 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 water control systems. And these required a lot of coordinations. So generally what happened is that the Acadians would meet in a parish assembly and they would elect uh, a delegate who had no coercive power whatsoever, but acted as a negotiator on behalf of the community. Uh, he would also be a mediator in conflicts. He was generally a well-regarded person, a person of certain wealth, but people who uh, he would be trusted, he could be evicted the following year. Uh, he was imputable for his decisions. And generally what happened is that he was also in charge of managing the dikes and in charge of, uh, of negotiation with the natives. So he would make sure that people would not, would be working on the dikes to open more land rather than move inland and trespass on native hunting grounds. And because he would basically organize the production of the dikes themselves, he would mix it with the production of negotiations with the Micmacs. And by being able to do the two at the same time, his incentives were aligned in ways to not cause violence to, uh, to erupt. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is there was uh, great trade between both groups. Uh, notably, one of the things the natives liked a lot was firearms. And so the, the Acadians were willing, and this is actually like if you look at literature, for example, where it was in New England or New France, uh, trading weapons to natives was always something that was done somewhat reluctantly, largely because you would be negating any technological advantage you would have by giving them firearms. So the only advantage that natives had initially would have been superior knowledge of, of the area. Uh, if you give them firearm and you, you're a European, uh, you're basically negating your only advantage. So they're getting all the hands uh, in their favor. But the Acadians, because they had no incentives to raid and their entire desire was to trade, they were quite okay. They didn't see any problem with giving them firearms for fur pelts, saying, okay, listen, uh, if, if, I give you a, if I give you a musket, you can use the musket to shoot, uh, <coughs> to hunt, uh, more easily other animals because you didn't want to shoot the, the beavers, right? You never wanted to shoot uh, the beavers because if you did shoot the beavers, uh, their pelts would be worth so much less. But if you gave them a gun, they would be able to hunt pat uh, patridges or quails more effectively. And so allocating more resources to the hunt uh, of beaver. And so they'd be more productive. So the Europeans, the, the Acadians were quite okay with trading firearm because they knew it would be used for hunting and they didn't have, they didn't see it as there'd be a conflict in the future. So you were in presence of two heavily armed groups because the Acadians were also well armed. We have some data in the censuses of the number of firearms they had. So they were very well armed on both sides. Uh, but it was the Acadians who armed the other side by trading, which suggests that eh, I'm not that worried about the outcome. So you were really in a, a trading environment because there was no gain to be had from violence, more specifically because the advantage that the Micmacs had could not be seized by the Acadians. The Acadians fought the Micmacs. Yes, they'd get their land, but they'd lose the comparative advantage that is not appropriable that the Micmac had in collecting fur pelts. Oh, and uh, speaking of the parish assemblies you mentioned, so of course they sort of use this uh, collective decision making and then sort of this semi-democratic process of electing someone like you said, a representative. Um, but uh, like in talking to mostly anarcho-communists about Acadia, what I found is they'll try to claim it for themselves. They're like, oh, they were communists, they were communal. But uh, from what I've read, like uh, Greg Gregory Kennedy, who wrote some on the uh, parish assemblies, he pointed out that Do you know the Canadians weren't collective. And yeah, I made sure I, I read through as much as I could find on this. I was trying to find books and, uh, and papers. Um, but yeah, he pointed out that they didn't have collective property or revenue. 
that uh, he could find at the time. That was back in 2008. Um, so as far as what you found. But, but you uh, know, this is, this is something where people don't understand economics. Right. Uh, communal property arrangements can still be private property arrangements. Uh, the thing is, is it matters to the unit that's organizing the property rights. So it technically, like think about your family. Within your family, there is a communal arrangement of food in the fridge, right? But from the vantage point of the rest of society, it is a private arrangement from them towards you. It's just within that particular form or group, you're organizing production in a particular way. Uh, the Acadians are thinking, okay, we have to trade with this other group. Uh, how do we organize production within ourselves in order to do so? It's not that there's no property rights, it's that there's a different arrangement of property rights. So there's like people think of property rights as I have a land deed. It doesn't work like that all the time. What is property rights? And this is this comes from Ronald Coase. It's a bundle of rights and liabilities that you engage in a trade. So I have obligations. So let's say you and I do a trade. I have liabilities to you. You have liabilities to me in the contractual arrangement we've made. And I have rights and you, your liabilities are my rights. My liabilities are your rights. And we're trading them and we're rearranging bundles of liabilities and rights in order to create trade, in order to incentivize trade. Now, you could call it communal. You can have a system of deliberation where people debate how they want to do it. I don't care. Uh, from the vantage point of an economist, for me, it's just a different mode of, of production and whichever people have found, and this is the Pete Leeson argument about everything, uh, since we're colleague, I'm quite okay with, uh, plus we, we write, we write, we write to get it. That was very Elmer Fudd of me. We write to wetter. Uh, we write together a lot. So I'm quite okay with publicizing him because it publicizes me at the same time. But what Pete and I always argue is whatever people did in the past, that you think looks dumb or looks X, it's it's probably they did what was actually not probably, they did what was the most efficient option available to them at that point. And standard neoclassical price theory and economics will explain that very well. You may have to dig into details a bit more, but you don't need stuff like anarcho-communism or for the fact of the matter is anarcho-capitalist stuff. Because as you noticed, all right, I did say a lot of really positive things about statelessness. And I do think that statelessness seems to yield really good outcomes. But I also said that because of these good outcomes, it can't be a stable outcome. Uh, it will eventually fade out. So it's kind of an answer that anarcho-capitalists should hate. For me, it's like, look, the system's so good and it won't last. Uh, so it's like, yeah, you're cre you're insane to to be an anarcho-capitalist because it won't. it's a system that will never sustain itself. It's a utopia. Uh, and it won't exist because the fact of the matter is the states will always exist in some form or, or another, and you're stuck with them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that states are what create economic growth. So they like that point, uh, but they don't like the other part where I say you can't, you can't not have them. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm an anarcho-capitalist, but I love to hear, you know, the different perspectives and hear the different arguments. I know there's so many, you know, you got Robert Nozick and uh, his arguments on anarchy. And actually, like actually, I see my argument as a twist of Nozick. Nozick is you, you will, rev from a state of statelessness, you're bound to end up with a state by virtue of uh, police uh, providers colluding until there is a single monopoly provider of violence and okay maybe but my argument is actually like flipping this around is if you have a stateless society and you have people with states well then you're bound not to have it it's just in my case it's, it's a proof of uh, 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 uh of also an unstable equilibrium as like statelessness under nozick is unstable in my case statelessness and high development is also unstable. Now, poor stateless societies will probably remain stateless because there's very little benefits from conquering that society, but also from the vantage point of that society, there's very little advantage in developing a state because there's no great wealth to protect against predators. So whatever cheapest form of organization works, 
will work and it will probably be without a state. So you'll still have tribal societies around the world today that are stateless, that don't have like an organized state. Uh, they don't have a monopoly on violence. There is much more consensual arrangements within the group. Uh, but it, it will last as long as they're poor or that no one wants to capture whatever little wealth they have. But in my case, is the conditional is if you're wealthy and you're stateless, you're not going to stay that way long. You're right? going to have a state to protect your wealth or somebody's going to take it and kick the crap out of you. All right, I think uh, Noah had uh, another question. Yeah, so uh, you did mention you were a libertarian. Uh, obviously, that doesn't influence your discoveries, just that influence the questions you ask. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what would you say is the biggest lesson you learned um, as from the paper, not necessarily in knowledge, but as far as um, influencing if any of your beliefs change after this on what policies you think we should move forward with um, to become a more libertarian society and where it should stop? So it was in the process of writing that paper that I came to, because initially what I had in the back of my mind was this two by two box I mentioned, uh, weak states, strong states, rich and poor. And I couldn't find, I was like, let's find examples of like, how many cases do we have of rich and weak, of rich societies with weak states? And I, each one I could find ended in either like you'd find like cases of Britain is considered like a relatively weak state society up to the 18th century. Then it starts building a big state to protect itself from the Spanish and the French. Uh, and that was a case where, you know, it reverted to having a strong, actually an exceptionally strong state by the standard of the time. And even by still modern standard, it was exceptionally powerful that people underappreciate how big and important and powerful uh, the British state was in the 18th, late 18th century, early 19th century. Uh, it's totally underappreciated. So it either ended like this, or it ended like medieval Iceland, where the Norwegians take over, kill a lot of Icelanders, and the, the country stagnates and declines for uh, a very long period of time, or it also ends like Acadia. I had other example. I was finding like the Mitzis of the Canadian prairies, same unfortunate development uh the uh the i'm doing work right now on the uh slave fugitives in jamaica seems like it follows the same pattern so why is it that the box always emptied itself and a process of seeing that the box could be populated but that eventually it is emptied out uh really convinced me that uh yeah, the 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 state capacity, the 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 anarcho capitalists need to understand that their case is as very strong in terms of if you care normatively about outcomes, then they're really good. Like there is no doubt that when you look at the empirical data, compare to the comparables at that point in time, you don't want to compare medieval Iceland with Iceland today. That'd be a stupid argument. What you want to compare medieval Iceland with? The rest of medieval Europe, but some and state organized medieval Europe. So you don't want to take like northern Germany. You want to take like Syria or Byzantine or like the papal state. That's what you want to take as as your comparison. And when you look at them, yeah, they, they fare actually quite good. They are either as rich or richer in spite of not having a state. Uh, so hooray! The anarcho capitalist state is case is strong, but at the same time is weak because. Why would you plead for something that will just is accidents of history uh, that could happen and uh, fortunate circumstances that eventually return to a much more established norm that there has to be uh, a state and thus that the mission should be more in considering what Jim Buchanan called uh, the rules of the game, taming the beast, controlling it or in the words of this case, more like Milton Friedman, uh, developing rules of the game that make it that we don't care who the player is. We only care that uh, good rules of the game, incentives for political actors will force even the worst piece of shit to do the right thing. Uh, and that's a completely different conversation. Uh, but it also says that you, the state doesn't improve economic growth. There's just 
better states than others. There's bad states, there's good mm -hmm. ones, but the state is not in and of itself a growth maximizer. Uh, it isn't. And uh, speaking of what you just mentioned, the papal states, uh, do you, are you very familiar with uh, Caspia? No, I'm not. I've heard. I've also, I'm more familiar with Eklund, Tolleson, and Hebert. Uh, also some work by Sasha Becker from the University, Monash University in Australia. Uh, these are the ones I'm most familiar with regarding uh, uh, the economic history of the papacy or religious reformation and counter-reformation uh, in and of itself. This is my extent of my knowledge. I also know Tom Wood's horrible Catholic Church Saved Western Civilization book. It's, it's a really bad book. Uh, but behind that, that's, yeah. Uh, I mean, ni neither of us are Catholic. Yeah, and my my Catholic co-host isn't here today to yell at you for that. So that's and not so great, it's it's great actually timing. It, no. He has a good he, he let's say it like that. Good cases have had better defenders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'd agree with that evaluation. All right, um, I can't think of too much more I had to say. I definitely would love to see someone make a really good paper on Caspi in the future. That would be great. I know Caspi wasn't as big as Acadia, but definitely a very interesting case study. Uh, so yeah, this is the, the Great Fiction Podcast. It was absolutely fantastic having uh, Vincent on here. And look, we don't agree on everything. You know, I'm still an anarcho-capitalist, but that's okay because I want to have great people on here. He's a, he's a great writer. He's done great research, great people on here to teach us stuff. Uh, I want to introduce you guys to more people that you may not know. He's what we call an anti-intellectual intellectual, intellectual uh, as Hoppe calls people in his books, you know, people who are really out there fighting the good fight. You know, we may not all agree on everything, but a lot of fantastic people out there. I want to continue introducing more of these people to you guys. So uh, thank you, Mr. Gelsano, for coming on. It was a pleasure. I'm very happy. And Again, it's not a bad thing to be an anarcho-capitalist. My only point is, actually, as I said, it's a very strong normative position. Unfortunately, I also would like uh, Narnia to to be to be real. <laughs> Unfortunately, it, it never will, even though the normative case for it is very strong. And in fact, there have been little Narnias. So like, you're the closest thing to utopia, to actually a practical utopia that can exist. It just won't last and won't persist. Uh, so and it's not exactly utopia either. It's like kind of a weird best case and it's okay to defend it. I'm very happy. There are some people who will point it out. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, un I think the positive case for it being persistent is very sadly, very weak because a normative case is strong. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you everyone for listening. Have a great day.